Hey folks, AshleyAllThingsEntry.com. We've got Dr. Partridge speaking with us. He's done a number of uh, videos already. and We're just continuing down the road of oral surgery tips for the general dentist. Like I mentioned before, Dr. Partridge has a wealth of knowledge as an exodontist and as a, a comprehensive dentist in the Army. So without further ado, Dr. Partridge. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for those uh, comments. Uh, before we start, I think you have access to the uh, to the CD online, and uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation, and people sometimes make the mistake of going through it like a regular slideshow, but it's really, I tell my residents, it's really an oral surgery manual. It just happens to be in PowerPoint format. So make sure you look at the in the uh, normal view where you have the didactic notes underneath of it, because really the crux of the whole show is in the didactic notes. Uh, you'll, you just won't take full advantage of it unless you read the notes. Uh, this is uh, oral surgery tips for the general dentist. This will not make an oral surgeon out of you. It's not to complete uh, the treatise on uh, general dentistry, but it's a lot of the questions that I frequently receive from my junior officers and residents over many, many years. And uh, this is kind of a work in progress, so if you have comments or questions, uh, please enter them on the blog there, and uh, maybe we'll try to enter those on the uh, address those in the next edition. Uh, first thing whenever you talk about dentistry is, of course, medical emergencies. As I always say, uh, just about the worst thing that happened to you is to have a patient die in your office. The very worst thing is to have a patient die in your office because you were not well equipped or prepared. So three things you really need to address are your equipment, supplies, medications. Make sure they're all there and up to date. Uh, make sure you have good emergency protocol and procedures outlined and all your personnel know how to carry them out. And third, make sure that you have good staff training and document that for your own edification also for medical legal reasons. I always refer you to uh, Stanley Malamed's book on medical emergencies in the dental clinic is one of the gold standards, but there's lots of these books around, so just make sure that you address uh, medical emergencies in, in your dental clinic. Uh, of course, automated uh, external defibrillator is almost standard of care now. I think these are well under $2,000, probably $1,500, so make sure that you have one of those on hand. Uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, make sure that you're, uh, we're dealing with blood and saliva and, and stuff flowing out of the mouth there, so make sure you're well equipped. Always compare this to what we call in the Army is uh, MOP-4, which is Military uh, Operational Protective Posture. And uh, when you go into chemical warfare or, or biological warfare, and as I say, it's almost like uh, germ warfare when you look at the patients and some of the things they have, the hepatitis, HIV, and uh, other communicable diseases. So make sure you're well protected. Uh, secondly, make sure your staff's well protected because uh, because of OSHA, you have to make sure your, your staff's well protected against you, uh, any uh, contamination from your patients. And another thing, I just you're, you need to develop a personal management style that you're very comfortable with. Uh, not only will it make your patient more comfortable, but it's going to make you a lot more comfortable and you'll be a lot uh, uh, more uh, satisfied with your dental practice. And uh, the last point there is to make sure you address the dental fear com uh, pain complex. Uh, we treat people for dental disease and injury, but you also have to uh, address their fear and anxiety complex. It'll make your life a lot easier and your patient's uh, life a lot more easier. Uh, know your patient. Uh, I always say it's a problem in institutional dentistry because uh, a lot of patients come down to Pike like uh, chassis down an assembly line and you go in there, the patient's there, the record's there, and you get to work. Well, the, sometimes the institution, the record doesn't always match the patient. So make sure you talk to the patient, make sure that it's the right record, review the medical history, that's very important. Make sure the dental uh, radiographs are all there and they're all up to date. And, and then do a clinical exam of the patient, both externally and internally. And then make sure that everything that's on the record matches what you have and you found an exam and make sure the diagnosis and treatment plan are confirmed both in your own mind and with the patient. So, again, use a five-minute rule as a minimum. Always spend at least five minutes with a new patient and know your patient. Uh, this is why it's important to have radiographs. You know, if that's a new lesion there, you know, what is that thing? Is it an donogenic care assist or maybe it's a, a, a arterial venal um, malformation and then you're going to have a gusher on you when you extract that tooth. So make sure you have current uh, radiographs. Evaluate your plan. Uh, you need to anticipate difficulties. Uh, in case there's a, a to, uh, endo tooth right next to one you're extracting, it may break off, you need to advise a patient on that. Uh, and of course you have to advise the patient on all informed consent. The three th big things on informed consent is provide them with plenty of uh, information on what's going to go on and what the risks are and what the alternatives are, what kind of alternative treatments, or what's the alternative to no treatment at all, and then make sure that they have a signed consent form on that. Then once you've assessed the procedures and, and discussed it with the patient, you've agreed on it, then you need what I call a dental plan of attack. That comes from my military background, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, you know, is it simple or complex? Do you need just a few simple instruments, or are you going to need a whole complete tray with a handpiece and all that? 
and the sequence of procedures. Normally we start with the upper teeth first and then the lower teeth because if you take out a lower tooth and then you break off an upper tooth or fragment or calculus or amalgam and it goes down the upper socket, you got to retreat it. And worse, if you don't know you broke off a piece of amalgam gets in the lower tooth and you got to go back in there three or four weeks later after they have an abscess and take it out of there. So do the top teeth first and then the lower ones. Normally you do the posterior teeth first and then the anterior teeth so you can use the anterior teeth as leverage to extract the uh, posterior teeth. And if all other things are the same then I like to do the most complex tooth last. And the reason I do that is because as soon as I finish that last complex tooth I like to suture it shut, uh, put a, a compress on it, and uh, then have the patient close and put an ice pack on the out, outside of it. You want to minimize the post-operative swelling and discomfort you're going to have. So save your last tooth, the most difficult one for last there. Okay. Uh, bony access. Uh, uh, when I plan the surgery, I do almost like a reverse planning. Uh, first thing you start with is a flap, but what I do is I, I, I plan how do you section the tooth first. And how you section the tooth is going to determine what kind of bony access, how much bone you have to remove in order to section the tooth correctly. And how much bone to remove is going to determine how you do the flap. So uh, it's just like in the military, military, you have an objective and then you decide what kind of firepower and logistics support you're going to have to have on board to achieve that objective. The same sort of principle applies here. And then finally, closures and sutures. How are you going to close that? Make sure you design your flap so that you have a good uh, circulation and what type of sutures you're going to use. And use appropriate instrumentation. Uh, we'll just run through some instruments here real quickly. This is our basic uh, standard tray. It's hard to get 100% of your instruments there. If you do, you'll have three or four trays worth of instruments. I usually get about 90% of the stuff that you think you're going to need for complex procedure, and then the last 10% you can plan based on uh, what that particular patient's procedures are. Uh, these are some of our standard forceps, a 150, 151. I like the 151S, which is a pedo one. It's very small. It's got a sharp angle on it. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice for working on uh, third molars, which you have a hard access getting into the back of the mouth. Uh, it gets into tight areas there. It's not very uh, long in the handles. Edge. It's short on torque, but it's a very effective instrument. And you can see this from the side. You can see how much smaller the, uh, the 150 uh, 1S is than your regular standard 150 and 150 instruments there. But it's good for tight, uh, small areas. Uh, sometimes you'll have a, a guy who'll have a big coordinated process or he can't open wide or he's got great big buckle, buccinator muscles. So the 151S is good for those tight areas. I, I just learned something now. Just when you told me that. Well, is there, okay. <laughs> okay, for the, the, the top, uh, there, there's a couple instruments I like for bicuspids. The 65, uh, which you see here, you know, nice thing about it, it has this little offset dog leg there for getting the bicuspids. And you'll notice that the nibs are very narrow. Another instrument that I found I like very well is called the 6-9, and it's got kind of a curved thing, but it's the same effect. The other thing, the 6-9 you can use for other teeth, sometimes lower anteriors where you have a real tight area. Frequently have a, a mile of line to bicuspid that's on the palatal version, and again, you can work this angle in there and weird angles, and you've got those narrow nibs and you get in tight areas, so that's a good uh, little uh, useful instrument. The 88s, uh, these are kind of like the cow horns or the, uh, of the maxillary arch. Uh, Normally, I'll, I'll take a 53 RL for the, if there's a nice good crown up there, but if it's got a large amalgam on it or it's endo tooth or broken down, there's nothing to grab a hold of. And so in those cases, I'll use the 88L or 88R. Now, they will do a little more damage to the alveolar process around there, but uh, if you break off the crown and have to take the handpiece out and remove a lot of bone, they'll, they'll do less damage than that. So uh, first choice is 53R and L, and then if there's not enough crown to grab a hold of, I'll use the 88L or 88R. For the lower arch, of course, you use the 23, which is the infamous cow horns. As you can see, it looks like the cow horns from the side view there. These are our standard elevators. I uh, start out with a 301, and then uh, usually go to a 304, and then a, a 34 as, as the tooth gets uh, more and more luxated. Uh, these are a couple instruments I like, the Cogswell A and the Cogswell B. They're easy to remember. Uh, a has an outline, looks like the letter A, and the B is bent on the tip. I like the A because when I do a lot of sectioning, I'll make kind of like a wedge-shaped slot in there, and that uh, Cogswell A is kind of narrow, it'll slide in there, but it's also wide enough that it can go all the way to the bottom of the pulp chamber, and then you twist it, and it'll just snap the tooth off real well. B is good for getting the purchase points. You drill a little purchase point in the side of the tooth if you're having trouble getting uh, uh, access to it, and then you can kind of elevate it out. Again, it takes a little practice to, to use those instruments correctly. Patient protection. Uh, Always use a, a mouth guard, especially when you're taking out lower tooth. As you know, you can uh, damage the alternate, the uh, 
the opposite uh, TMJ. I don't always use it when I'm doing most of the work, but as soon as I put any torque on the tooth with either elevator or forceps, always protect the opposite TMJ with a, a bite block, either pedo or large size. Uh, also make sure you protect the uh, pharyngeal airway. So as soon as you're ready to deliver the tooth, uh, make sure that you get a big uh, pharyngeal gauze. Usually use a four by four in there. Now some patients will gag a little bit, and in cases like that, what I'll do is I'll take just a two by two, I'll unfold it so it's real thin, I'll pack it over to that side, say it's on the left side, for number 17 or number 16, and then I'll have the patient rotate his head to the left, so hopefully gravity will pull the tooth out to the side. Not the perfect solution, but it's a lot better than having an open airway and having him aspirate that. So there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. And a set of considerations. Uh, always go over the patient's medical history, like I said, in the five-minute thing at least. Make sure you know uh, your patient's health history real well. Of course, we're always concerned about uh, epinephrine and, and, and cardiac conditions and other things. Uh, you know, the, the golden rule is two carpials of, a epine of a anesthetic with one to 100,000 has more, less epinephrine than endogenous epinephrine they generate. And that's generally true. Not always. If they have an exceptional medical case, you may want to consult with a physician. But generally, you'll be safe by uh, following that rule. Uh, type and duration of procedure. You know, obviously, the Duranest and the, uh, Mar Marcaine are going to last a lot longer than, uh, than, um, than lidocaine. So uh, depend how long your procedure is, you want to select a, the one that will last the longest for you. The other thing is the presence of inflammation or infection. Uh, the anesthetic has what they call a PKA, which is a neutral point at which uh, half the solution is in a cation molecule, and the other half is in the weak base form. The weak base form is the one you want that takes effect. So the body is normally about 7.4 pH, so if you have a PKA like 8.9 for bupivacaine, or marcaine, then uh, it's going to take a long time for it to take effect. But if you have lidocaine, which is 7.9 uh, pH, then it's going to work a lot quicker. The problem is when you get into infections, the pH of the body can be as low as 5.3 or 5.4, so then you even have a greater gap between the pH and the pKa. So in those cases, for infiltration, I like to use uh, carbocaine or bupivacaine, just 3% aqueous, and for a couple reasons. Number one, the pKa is 7.6, which is about as low as it gets. The other thing is, uh, mepivacaine does not have a vasopressor in it. And when you have an infected area, the body tries to wall it off with fibroblasts and, and neutrophils and other things. So it's going to take a little harder, a little longer for the in, uh, anesthetic to infiltrate there. So uh, I like to start off the infiltration in, uh, near an infected area with uh, carbocaine. And then later, if you want to add lidocaine or something with epinephrine to control bleeding, you can. Uh, third, uh, last item on there, of course, is pregnancy. Look at your pregnancy drugs. Lidocaine is a pregnancy B, so is adidocaine and prilocaine. All the others are pregnancy C. So generally, we use lidocaine on our uh, pregnant patients. Uh, this is a needle modification. Uh, I think we talked about this earlier. Yes, sir. We can just refer to one of the other videos. We can refer to other one of the natives. I, I like to curve the needle a little bit because, it, as it says there, it makes them stiffer so they're more accurate, uh, less deflection. Also, I find that you get a little better access when you, you curve the needle there. Uh, again, don't bend the needle. Uh, I, I went to undergrad in engineering school. Anytime you bend something, it creates a lot of stress in there. The worst thing to do is bend it at the hub. There's automatic stress at the hub. Anytime there's a change in shape or size there, uh, if you go down the street and you see a flagpole or a signpost that's broken off, it's broken off right at the ground. You know, airplanes' wings separate, they don't break in mid-wing, they break right where the wing joins the fuselage, so there's an automatic weak spot there. So don't bend the needle at the hub. And curved things, like I say, are just naturally stronger. You look at a thin edge eggshell, look how strong it is just because all the surfaces are on a curve. Okay, I think that, uh, let's see, we'll run through some of our access, as I say here. Access is a little easier, easier. You don't have to bend the cheek out quite so far. You get better access to the maxillary. And also, you can reach around. If you've got a large hyaloid ridge there, you can reach around out and get to the lingual with your uh, lower ones. And this is just an artist rendition of the same thing that you can see. You can kind of, you don't have to stretch the lip out so far right here. You can just kind of go up and in, up around there. Same thing here on the on the lower one, you don't have to bring the barrel of the syringe clear out here and stretch the patient's cheek and go more straight in and then curve it around there. Uh, internal pterygoid is usually a little closer right in there. It's kind of separated there for artist rendition. And sometimes that'll deflect the needle and cause you to miss your uh, inferior valve either. So uh, we do have another video on that. If you want to go into that a little more detail, you can look at that. 
Okay, that uh, that pretty well concludes today's uh, first session. I think it's long enough. And uh, if you have any comments, uh, you can just uh, add those on there because this is a, a work in progress, and we'll try to address those in, in, the, in the next issue. All right. Thank you, sir.